given you a bit of a preview of what we're looking at this evening. Let's go ahead and read the text, and then we'll get into it. So we're going to read Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 39. So beginning in verse 27, Luke writes this, again, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let's remember that this is... Uh, not the word of of just Luke. This is superintended by the Holy Spirit so that this is the word of God. Luke writes this, After that he went and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, The disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, You cannot make the attendants of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. And he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled out, and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new, for he says, the old is good enough." Well, again, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now, remember this morning we saw Jesus um, healing the the paralytic uh, to demonstrate to those who had gathered around him that he had the authority as the Son of God to forgive sin. We also looked at his cleansing of the man covered with leprosy. And we looked at it not only as an act of pure compassion on the part of our Lord that he would touch one who was unclean, uh, and one who had a a disease that was considered to be contagious. But we also looked at it as a picture of what the Lord does for us uh, spiritually. Because, as we noted, we all came into the world spiritual lepers and outcasts from God's kingdom. Even as the lepers were outcasts from the society of God's people, we were outcasts from the kingdom of God. But because of what Jesus has done, the Father was willing to reach out and take hold of us in his mercy, to cleanse us of our rottenness and our corruption, and to bring us into his family through trust, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is what God gave us in his grace. You know, uh, again, we deserve to be outcasts. Uh, We were despicable in his eyes, but he showed mercy to us. God gave us this mercy. He didn't give us, again, what we deserved, justice, for our animosity towards him, for our offenses against him. He gave us grace, which means he gave us things we don't deserve. That's what grace is. Grace um, is, again, forgiveness, righteousness, a welcome into his family because of what Jesus Christ has done and not because of what we have done. Now, again, we know that our Lord uh, calls us also to be gracious, even as he has been gracious to us. And I think this evening we see our Lord, again, demonstrate more of his grace in in several other ways, again, as an example to us of how we ought to extend the same grace to um, to those who are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, even to those who are our enemies. Now, I think we see that in about five different ways. First of all, we see it in his calling of Levi, which is what this is essentially all about. Uh, Jesus now, Luke tells us, calls his fifth disciple. This time he's calling 
a tax collector, a man by the name of Levi, who is also known to us uh, by the name of Matthew, uh, the apostle who would later write the gospel by the same name. Now, we do need to understand at the outset who Levi was. Uh, Levi was uh, not only a traitor to God, it says essentially all of us were when we came into the world because we sinned in Adam, we rebelled in Adam, and of course when we got old enough to express our own hearts, we personally also rebelled against God. But Levi was also a traitor to his own people. Uh, he was uh, one of these tax collectors who was paying the Roman government for the, the right to farm, as it were, his own people, to collect taxes from them, not only for Rome's benefit, but also for his own benefit. Uh, Jews, as you probably know, hated tax collectors as much as they hated Gentiles because in their eyes they were traitors to the enemy and they were taking advantage of their own people for their own benefit and for the benefit of their enemies. But we do need to notice that that didn't stop Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus uses this as an opportunity to show us the depths of his grace and his mercy. He reached out to this tax collector. He came to Levi while he was sitting in his tax booth, which was essentially his tax office. And he said to him, follow me. Now, this call to Levi is essentially, first of all, an offer of eternal life. That's how Jesus called people uh, to, to this life, with the call of follow me. In, in Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's what it meant to be a disciple. A disciple is one who sits under the master and who learns from him to become like him. It is enough that the dis disciple become like his master. But to do that, you had to follow him. Now, the fact that Jesus made this offer to one of the most despised class of Jews uh, is to remind us again of the depths of his grace, but it also reminds us that we also are not to withhold God's offer of mercy, even to the worst of men. Now, we're, we're aware that our Lord Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount tells us that we should not cast our pearl, the, uh, pearls before swine. In other words, we are not to give the gospel to those who are going to despise it and trample them under their feet, right? But you don't know whether they're going to do that unless you first try to give them the gospel. And if after repeated attempts, they, they despise the gospel and despise you and they're going to treat the Lord Jesus in this way, that's when we no longer offer the gospel to them. Remember that Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out to preach the gospel in the different villages. If they don't receive you there, then as you leave that town, shake the dust off of your feet as a testimony against them. And he talks about how severe it will be for them in the day of judgment. So we are to extend the gospel, this offer of mercy, even to the worst of men. But if they reject and despise it, then we are no longer to do so. So first of all, this was an offer to Levi of uh, salvation, of, of eternal life. But this was second of all, as we know from reading later in the Gospel of Luke and the other Gospels, this was also a call to apostleship. Because this is, you know, this is Matthew. This is one of those that Jesus is going to set apart to be one of his inner circle, one of the 12. Now, it is a great privilege, obviously, even to receive the gospel call to salvation. Sometimes we don't realize what a great privilege it is, but just put yourself in another country in that darkness in places where the gospel hasn't reached. And then you would realize just, especially on the day of judgment, just how blessed you really are. We have the gospel. We've received that call. Not everybody has even this much. But how much more of, a, of an honor and a blessing is it, in the case of Levi, to be called to be one of the twelve? Think about the small circle of people who had the gospel even in Jesus' day. Matthew gets it, and Matthew also gets this call to be a disciple. But again, this is our Lord's grace. 
He calls the lowest and most despised to make them princes in his kingdom. You know how Paul says that God doesn't call the great men of the world, not, not the, the wise of the world, not the, the mighty, not, not the, the rich, but he calls those things which are weak and foolish and despised in order that he might show forth his grace, to show how gracious he really is and to show his power through these weak vessels. Well, here we see him doing this with Levi. Now, the second thing we see here, of course, is his grace in making this call to Levi powerful to save. Jesus said on one occasion in Matthew 22, verse 14, many are called, but few are chosen. Okay, so a small minority right now of the human race has been called by that outward call of the gospel, but even fewer among them are actually chosen to actually receive the gift of eternal life. Now, there are many, many more we know who will be called by the gospel, who will hear the outward call of the gospel in churches, in evangelistic outreaches, than will respond to that call, uh, than who will receive that inward call of the Holy Spirit. The new birth that Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about, right? That unless you're born of the water, of, of the water of the Word and the Holy Spirit, unless the Spirit of God makes the gospel powerful, it's not going to save you. That's what makes the call of the gospel, the outward call, powerful to save, is the inward call of the Holy Spirit that changes the heart and the disposition so that one will receive that, that Christ that's offered in the gospel. Jesus tells us relatively few are chosen by God. Many are called, but few are chosen to eternal life. Now, again, God's grace is seen in this, that Levi was one of these who received the inward call and was chosen by God to be one of his sheep. And we see that from his response in verse 28. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. Remember, this is what Peter and Andrew and James and John also did when the Lord called them, only in this case it, it seems even more remarkable because we know that Jesus was interacting with these other fishermen before he called them and they left everything. It almost seems as though he comes to Levi just out of the blue. I'm sure Levi knew something about him because his ministry was becoming quite public. Word was going out everywhere about Jesus. But I'm not sure that he had actually met Jesus before. But Jesus calls him, and he leaves everything, just as these other fishermen left everything, their fishing boats and their nets, and they began to follow Jesus. Now, this, I think, is a clear example of the difference between those who come savingly to the Lord Jesus Christ and those who maybe profess faith in Christ because they believe that these, these things about Jesus in the Bible are actually true. But again, Jonathan Edwards reminds us, as James reminds us in uh, James chapter 2, that just believing the facts doesn't really mean anything because the devils believe. The devils know these things are true and, and they tremble, but they're not saved by these things. There's a difference between just believing facts and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that difference is the way we live from that point forward. Those who receive that, that inward call, that saving grace of the Holy Spirit, begin to love Jesus. They, want, they desire Jesus, and they love him enough to give up everything to follow him. Remember how Jesus said on one occasion, again, this theme keeps coming up again and again in Scripture, how no one can be my disciple unless you give up all your own possessions, even uh, unless you're willing to give up your own life, unless you take up your cross uh, to follow him if the Lord should call us to do that. And those, of course, who don't have the inward call, they cannot bring themselves to make this sacrifice. And that's often the reason why during persecution, as Jesus reminds us in the parable of the sower, that there is that seed that under the, the heat of persecution withers away because it has no depth of root, you know, no, no depth, well, there's no depth of soil because of the rocky soil and the roots don't go down long, far enough to support the plant and they die, they don't bear fruit, okay? So that, that's how it, they're weeded out, but that which falls in the good soil bears much fruit. So again, here we see this difference, and isn't this the difference that we also see in the rich young ruler? Remember the rich young ruler? Jesus 
essentially called him to do the same thing as he was calling Levi to do. But we read with regard to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, verse 21, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And then Jesus goes on to say how difficult it will be for those who are rich to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the problem is, of course, riches become an idol. We need to love Jesus more. Uh, that's what that first hymn is all about. Do not I love you, O my Lord? Don't I love you more than the things of this world? Wouldn't I be willing to give it all as well as my blood for your glory? That's how we know that we have the inward call of the Holy Spirit, that we're born again of the Holy Spirit when we are willing to give all that we have to Him. If we are, it's not because we worked up that, that ability in ourselves or that desire. It's because of God's grace at work in our hearts. Now, thirdly, we see Jesus' grace in his willingness to reach out to other sinners as well. We see in verse 29 that when Levi left everything to follow Jesus, and here's another important principle, he didn't necessarily lose everything that he had, okay, in the same way that Peter didn't. Okay? Peter left everything to follow Jesus, but Peter still had a house that he was maintaining. He had a mother-in-law. He had a wife. He was ministering to, well, he asked Jesus to minister to his mother-in-law. Well, Levi also had a house. But now he was using this as well as the other things he possessed to honor Jesus. We read in, in this text that uh, he held a large reception for Jesus in his house. And he used the opportunity to invite some of his associates now, it does say the scribes and Pharisees were, were also here, and I, I don't know that he necessarily invited them to come. I'm sure they wouldn't want to come. But I think they were also outside seeing what was going on, all these people gathering in Levi's house. I'm sure they knew very well where Levi lived and hated him. And when they saw Jesus go in there with all the other tax collectors, they gathered around to see what was going on. But the point is that Levi invited his friends to come and to hear Jesus. Uh, when our Lord brings us to himself, you know, we're often embarrassed to tell other people about our commitment to Christ, our change of life, change of our direction, because it's so contrary to the world. If people don't understand, and they're, they're going to hate us for it, and they're going to turn away from us. And so we, we tend not to want to be the witnesses that our Lord calls us to be. But we need to notice here that Levi didn't have that particular problem, did he? Even though it wouldn't make him popular... He wanted his friends to hear Jesus so that they too might receive his mercy and his forgiveness. And here again we see our Lord's grace in that uh, even though this reception brought together the less than desirable and even though it would make him uh, less than desirable to the scribes and Pharisees, uh, he was still willing to come and to sit with them and to eat with them. He came that he might bring them the gospel, and that they might receive his life. Now, again, this is something that our Lord wants us to do. He wants us to reach out to others. And we're going to see this in the next point, okay, because Jesus is going to say this in response to his enemies. And here's where we see, again, another example of Jesus' grace, where he answers his enemies' questions uh, that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, the first thing they wanted to know was, why are you, Jesus, here with them? Why is a rabbi eating and drinking with these outcasts, with these traitors, with these enemies of your own people? Um, of course, excluding themselves as, um, uh, from being a part of that because um, they wouldn't be a part of that. Why are you? We're not. Why are you? Well, Notice that Jesus didn't ignore the question, did he? Though he might justly have ignored the question, because why were they asking the question? They only wanted to find some other reason to accuse him and to trap him. But Jesus answered. He answered graciously. Even though he answered with a reply that was meant to be somewhat of a, of a mild rebuke against them. But even that can be gracious, right? if the intention behind it is to do them good. And I think that Jesus certainly intended to do good to them. He wasn't intending 
uh, simply to uh, condemn or accuse them. He says in verses 31 and 32, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, this was a rebuke to the Pharisees because this is not what, what they would do. The Pharisees spent their time with each other. They considered themselves to be righteous and all others sinners and, and basically not worth their time and, again, unclean. They wouldn't have anything to do with them, so they would pull their skirts in around people like this whenever they passed by. Now, Jesus was basically saying that as God's children, we are not to avoid sinners, but we are to take them the medicine that they need to be made well. As the church, we're not simply called to be fellowshipping with one another. Uh, those who are well, you know, we're already well through the gospel, but we are to go through those who are sick. We are to bring the medicine to them. We are to be gracious as our Lord is gracious. Uh, we are to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, finally, we see the Lord's grace in granting to his disciples uh, a time of, of blessing, a, a time to be nurtured, a time of growth, before making them face the trials that were coming. Now, this is all implied in the next question that is asked, uh, and it's, it's really not quite clear who asked the question uh, in verse 33. It says, and they said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. Now, this, this is an implied question, right? Basically, why aren't your disciples fasting when the disciples of John are fasting and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting? Uh, but notice that in the question, the disciples of John are, are included. Why do the dis disciples of John fast? And the disciples of the Pharisees are included. Why, why do they fast? It, it seems to be somebody is asking this question that is not a part of either of these two groups. So who is asking the question? Well, Jesus was sitting around some tax collectors, wasn't he, that were gathered there by Levi in order to hear the gospel. And there were others that were also gathered there. From uh, other parallel passages in the gospel, they're, they're called sinners. Um, we're, we're all sinners, but these are the ones that the Pharisees would consider sinners, and they actually were sinners because they hadn't been reconciled to God, and they could be from a host of, all, of different kinds of, of walks of life. But it, it's perhaps likely that uh, somebody there was perhaps struck by the ministry of our Lord Jesus. Maybe the Spirit was beginning to work in their hearts because of His ministry, and they were beginning to ask questions that were actually significant questions. And they wanted to know, why are you different? Why uh, are your disciples behaving differently than these other two groups uh, who fast? Well, who's asking the question doesn't matter, but Jesus' response does matter. This is what he says to them. You cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. Uh, at a wedding, you know, it's a time of celebration. You don't spend that time fasting, mourning. But rather, you spend that time rejoicing. This was a time of rejoicing. Now, the interesting thing here is that um, is fasting, right? John taught his disciples to fast. The Pharisees and their disciples also fasted. Uh, we know from um, actually later in the, in the uh, Gospel of Luke, when Jesus gives the parable of the uh, the tax collector and the, uh, the Pharisee that go into the temple to pray, that the Pharisee, as he's praying, is boasting before the Lord, I fast twice a week. Now, so in other words, um, the question is, is basically not asking, you know, why do, the or why do the Pharisees and their disciples observe the fasts that are commanded in the Scriptures? But why do they fast often? Why do they fast twice a week? Um, and John's disciples... Why are they fasting? We know that they fasted for a completely different reason. They fasted because they knew that the coming of Christ was, was near. They were fasting for the coming of the kingdom and the advancement of the kingdom and the strength of the Lord to serve him faithfully, where the Pharisees were only fasting to put on a show, 
to show everybody and themselves just how righteous they really were. John's disciples fast, Pharisees fast. Why aren't your disciples fasting, Jesus? Well, Jesus had not yet made that a part of his discipleship because, first of all, he was still with them. Again, this example of how uh, a marriage is a time of, of uh, feasting and a time of joy and rejoicing. The bridegroom, Jesus, was there. He was there with the bride. How could they, again, humble themselves and fast and seek the Lord when everything was, again, so uh, really just so much filled with blessing, the blessing of our Lord's presence? Well, that wasn't the time of fasting, but Jesus said the days were coming when the bridegroom would be taken away, when he would be crucified, when he would die, when he would be buried. He would raise again the third day. He would be there for 40 more days. But then he was going to leave them to face the world. They were going to be his representatives. They were going to do his work. They would have to face the hostility of the world against them. In those days, he says, they will fast. They will fast to find the strength that they need in order to do his work. Now, it's after the statement that Jesus illustrates what he just said with these three parables that have really, it's really sometimes uncertain exactly what he's saying. I don't know if you've, if you've read these recently and tried to come to grips with what he's saying. The parable of the, the new cloth, which is used to patch the old garment, of the new wine that is poured into the old wineskins, and then this one that appears only in Luke, where drinking the old wine, you prefer that so well, you don't want to drink uh, the new wine. Uh, the question is, what, what does that actually mean? Well, I think that we, we do have to apply it in the context, right? And the context is, why isn't or why aren't the disciples of Jesus fasting? Well, this appears to be the reason. These parables are meant to give us a reason as to why they, they are not. And I think Jesus is, is saying this, <clears throat> that in the same way that no one would take new cloth and put it on an old garment or put new wine into old wineskins. So, he says, I'm not going to press these new converts into the rigors of a more advanced Christianity, these new converts into this, as it were, system of that, you know, is more mature, is, is older, because it would injure them and I think it would also perhaps injure the cause for which they are serving the Lord, okay? And uh, this old wine, new wine is perhaps a little bit different when he says basically in the same way that those who are used to the old wine or, or to the old way of doing things, they don't want to drink the new because they think is, the old is good enough, so the disciples were not yet ready for the more serious road, but would be, become accustomed to it little by little, okay? I think that that is essentially what Jesus has in mind behind these parables, that you don't force it too quickly. Otherwise, you injure, the, well, you injure actually both, but particularly the new converts because, I mean, how, how old was Levi and the Lord? Why aren't you fasting, Levi? Well, he's just come to, he's just come to faith in Christ, and, and he, Jesus is there. Why aren't the others? Well, they've only been with Jesus a, perhaps a few days or a few weeks or perhaps months by this time, but still very young in the Lord. And I think the point is this, <clears throat> that when <clears throat> the Lord first saves us, he does take it easy on us, right? There's a bit of this honeymoon period uh, where when things are new, the Lord brings us along much more gently, I think, giving us time to grow. Uh, he puts us in the greenhouse. I think you probably heard this illustration before. Just like these new plants, these young plants can't really go out into the more severe weather. They're, they're kept in this environmentally controlled atmosphere until they grow up and get strong enough to put them out into the stronger weather, which they need to be so that they can bear fruit. And they need to be because they, they need the weather, this more severe weather to cause them to grow more. Our Lord keeps us in the greenhouse until he takes us out when we're ready uh, and places us in the world so that we can grow stronger 
And as he does, he lays on us greater responsibilities of service in his kingdom. And again, the point is essentially this, that the, because the Lord is gracious, the Lord is, is patient with us. You know, he doesn't slap on us the full responsibility as soon as we come to faith in Christ, but he allows us, as it were, little by little to, to grow up before we bear that whole load, that whole mantle. Remember what Jesus said on another occasion, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, look at some of the things that the apostles actually had to go through. I think we, we would say that's not necessarily an easy burden to bear, but it is initially when the Lord brings you to himself. And of course, the fact that we grow and can bear more is a tremendous blessing. So again, we need to learn from this example of our Lord Jesus Christ to be patient with ourselves. Sometimes we expect too much of ourselves right away and we try to do more than we can and when we do that, we of course will meet with failure. We need to be patient with ourselves and allow ourselves some time to grow as the Lord works with us. But we also need to be patient with each other as the Lord brings us along and causes us to grow little by little into his image. Now, this doesn't mean that it's okay not to grow. That it's okay to remain a spiritual infant forever and never to engage the enemy. We're just simply saying here that the Lord gives us time to reach that stage. We need to be striving to grow, and he's going to be working in our lives to cause us to grow, but we just need to understand it does take a bit of time for ourselves and for others. So may the Lord give us the grace to be gracious as he is gracious in all these different ways, in reaching out again to those who are perhaps less desirable and being willing to patiently answer their questions and, of course, um, in just being patient uh, with, with others. Well, may the Lord bless his word uh, to our hearing. Let's, let's bow in a moment of silent prayer, shall we?